your guests, participants. We are welcoming you on the Ferry Contracts in Georgia webinar today. It is organized with the support of the Georgian Association of Consulting Engineers. And um, also, I would like to uh, give a short uh, presentation about speakers. Uh, Mr. Irakli Hagani, uh, the Association of uh, Consulting Engineers Georgia President. Uh, he's acting country director representative at Doha Engineering Co. And uh, Ms. Nina Tsaturova, she's a head of Legal Intelligence Solutions LLC. Uh, she's a FIDIC certified adjudicator. And she's the Association of Consulting Engineers Georgia Management Board member. Uh, I will give the word to Nina. Second. Board member, uh, the management board member of the ASIC, the Georgian Association of Consulting Engineers, FIDIC member, and also the DRBF country representative in Georgia, the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation. Um, that was my brief introduction. Uh, we, I think now we can move to our questions, see if Andre permits. Uh, yes, of course. Give me two seconds, <laughs> two minutes, please. My name sure. is Andrei Artushenko. I'm a managing partner of the Artushenko and Partners Law Firm from Kazakhstan. We are making a set of webinars uh, regarding the FIDIC application, the FIDIC contracts issues regarding the application, so on and so on, uh, in different uh, post-Soviet Union countries, let's say. We already uh, made several one, uh, seminars, uh, webinars uh, for Russia, for Kazakhstan, for Uzbekistan. And uh, in the following two, three weeks, we will make uh, uh, the final one uh, in this set for Ukraine. All these webinars are in Russian, except for Georgia. We are making it in English. And all of, uh, of the webinars are all already available uh, online uh, via our YouTube channel, uh, Artushenko and Partners. And this webinar will be uh, online as well. As you heard of the sound that it is under recording, uh, it, it will be available in couple days. In couple of days, um, and please, uh, again, I, I will remind you: if you have any comments, please put them in the chat. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A section. Okay, uh, we will then proceed. Um, dear speakers, we have time limit: uh, two hours in total, and uh, around four five minutes per question. Uh, if it is, if it will be easy one, I, I believe we can do it faster. If it will be more interesting, we will uh, we, we will give a bit more time. But uh, first of all, we need to answer first twelve questions. Thank you very much. And uh, the first question from the participant was uh, about EOT and additional costs. Does COVID nineteen gives us possibility to claim for additional costs by contractor contractor's side. And this question was from Tbilisi, mm -hmm. from Netia. Yeah, who will answer? Thank you. I will address this question. Thank you, Andre. Um, it's, of course, I understand uh, the importance of this question. It's, there is no really straightforward answer to this question because uh, it depends uh, on the circumstances and legislation of each country the, where this uh, pandemic situation is and uh, the uh, legislation of the contract which is governed by this legislation. So the general uh, answer to this question is yes, in principle, um, you can claim additional costs uh, in case of COVID-19. But I would like just to give you um, a guidance to where find uh, the specific questions uh, regarding the cost and uh, extension of time due to pandemic. Uh, FIDIC uh, issued a very useful guidance uh, memorandum uh, concerning the COVID-19, and I can share you uh, on the screen and um, give you some examples of how it deals with uh, different kind of situations. Mm, let me one moment, uh, Andre, I will uh, share the screen with your permission. Sure. Here you go. You can see my screen, right? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. 
It was issued in April 2020, like uh, in the very, very middle of this uh, pandemic uh, COVID uh, madness <laughs> that was everywhere throughout the world. So um, it is very timely, I would say, because there were a lot of questions and the contractors and the employers uh, had to deal with this difficult situation. So there are several scenarios uh, that the questions uh, are posed and the scenarios considered. And um, you can look at this, it is uh, free for download on the FIDIC website. And I can also share this document uh, with Andre uh, for your convenience, and then he can share it to you. So you don't have to search it uh, on the website or everywhere or anywhere in the internet. Just to give you an example of the additional costs, uh, first of all, the situation is, and the matters to consider is whether the um, COVID-19 poses uh, any changes uh, in the legislation. If yes, then you can refer to um, subclause 13.7 uh, in the 99 editions uh, in every uh, in um, yellow book and red book and so on. Uh, and in 13.6 uh, in the new editions in uh, 2017. And if uh, there are some pieces of legislation that um, uh, introduce some changes, so for example, in Georgia, there were introduced some um, decrease of the government uh, regarding the infrastructure projects and regarding other restrictions. And yes, in principle, you can claim additional costs. Um, there is also a different situation where, for example, there is no changes in laws due to the pandemic, uh, then potentially you can refer to subclause 8.4e, um, which deals with the time extension, but uh, the general guidance to this clause is that it depends um, on the circumstances of the specific case. Uh, when you can uh, claim uh, additional costs as well, in addition to the extension of time. So my general answer to this question is, uh, it depends, <laughs> the favorite answer to the, as lawyers really like this answer, but it really depends on the, first of all, the circumstances of the cases, uh, the um, legislation that is government, just these two matters are crucial to answering these questions. Uh, hopefully this is just the brief uh, introduction to this very brief and very difficult question. And uh, as I told you already, I will share this document uh, with Andre so that he can share it with you and you don't have to search for it. Sure, please just write down in the comments or um answering our email where we send a link today uh, and i will uh, send this uh, document uh, sure. no problems yeah the following question is uh the same person i believe yes the same person asks uh, i'm also interested uh if it's planning some learning courses in georgia for fidic yeah for the contracts, you know, I, yes. for <laughs> I think I will also address this question. Thank you, Andre. As Rakli already mentioned it, we are planning to have the official PDK accredited course in October. Uh, we are partnering with the FIDIC accredited trainer and the, as you know, again, because of this pandemic situation, there were some um, restrictions um, to, between our countries, he's from UK and we are now in Georgia. So now Georgia is not anymore on the red list for the UK and now it is possible for the trainer to come to Georgia. So we plan to have the training on the 20. Uh, first 22 of October. Stay tuned with us for for the association's LinkedIn page, and you can also leave uh, your um, email, and uh, you will receive more information from us. You will hear from us on this regard. Uh, this is uh, the quite short notice, I would say, just two uh, weeks, but. Um, um, I think uh, it will be very successful, and uh, if you're interested, please let us know. Uh, what, what will be the subject of this training? Uh, what kind of 
contract. contract. We are planning to do contract because the last time, uh, last year in February, we did the claims. Uh, it was mm -hmm. online. And now we are planning to do it uh, in person because people are eager to have the person, <laughs> person trainings. And so we are also very keen on it and the last time we had the training in Tashkent Andre was also yeah. there it was very nice to fantastic. have a person training, training yeah. after all this madness uh, after the COVID. <laughs> yeah. Sure uh, thank you very much uh, I hope uh, our participants will participate this training as well uh, maybe Rakli wants something to it. I, I just wanted to add that the, uh, it's also it's long time that we haven't did a live training. Uh, it's almost like one more than more than one year. Yeah, more. Uh, we are very happy to hold that. And additional information, of course, you you can find on our social medias and also on the official website of FIDIC, I believe. So, uh, any interesting part okay. is and happily join us. Very good. Um, if you don't mind, uh, maybe you can put in the chat uh, some kind of uh, email where to write if uh, yes. people will have questions about this uh, particular education. Okay, uh, we are moving on. Uh, third question, main principles of the agreement. Oh, quite a broad question. Um, yes. You can comment on it. Please. Uh, as I'm the lawyer, I will address this question. As you know, Iraq is the engineer, so this question is directly to me. Well, it's a very broad uh, topic, I would say. Um, just to give you a brief introduction to it and what the FIDIC contracts are, because I believe that it concerns FIDIC, because we are talking about it today. Of course, of course. So just to give you a general uh, definition of what is a contract or what is an agreement, uh, it's a, a contract is an agreement uh, having a lawful object uh, and entered into voluntarily by two or more parties, each of whom intends to create one or more legal obligations between or among them. So it's a very broad legal definition. Who, which uh, the lawyers will enjoy, but I know that several people here are my colleagues. Uh, thank you for attending it. Just to give you um, um, a brief introduction to the legal character of what FIDIC contracts is, well, the, legal contra the, the legal character of the FIDIC contracts. First of all, what I need to mention is that a FIDIC is a private organization and it has no legislative powers. And this is the misunderstanding that uh, I hear frequently, for example, in Georgia or in other countries. Uh, use of FIDIC forms of contract does not mean that the parties to a FIDIC contract escape from any national law. So it means that uh, there is a special subclause in the FIDIC contracts which deals with the government, governing law of uh, the contract. It means that uh, the law of the country and the FIDIC interacts with each other and there are several questions about how this interaction is dealt with and I will address it later. No. What is this FIDIC standard contracts? They are simply general trade terms, very widely used worldwide uh, because um, it goes back to uh, 60s, uh, 1960s when the first uh, forms were used and since then they are very popular and FIDIC constantly upgrades uh, the edition. So the recent edition is 2017, just to let you know, and I, um, I, uh, I'm sure that um, a lot of people are aware of that. And the last uh, misunderstanding that I wanted to uh, mention also about the FIDIC contracts, the legal character of the FIDIC contracts is that uh, one cannot assume that the parties to a FIDIC contract expect their agreement to be governed by FIDIC. This is also a very interesting uh, um, perception that I, is the, um, that I hear uh, in Georgia or in other countries that uh, people, when people are dealing with a uh, FIDIC contract, they expect that FIDIC has some power uh, for this, but it's not. It, the, con the FIDIC contract is the contract between two parties between um, the contractor and the employer. 
And there is also another party, very important one in the red book, in the uh, yellow book, uh, in silver book, no, more or less, I will talk about it, the engineer. The engineer is the representative of the employer, but um, this is one of his main roles, of course, but uh, in some situations he, have, uh, he has to uh, act uh, fairly and neutrally. And I will not talk about this standard and what it means right now, because uh, that's not the question, but just to let you know that uh, the main principle of the PD contracts is that uh, the employer may have uh, the representative, it's representative with the engineer, but the engineer does not sign the contract. So the uh, PD contracts are mainly uh, between two parties, the employer and the contract. This is just the main principles uh, of the PD contract. So just to summarize that uh, PD contract is a two-party contract between the employer and the contractor. And uh, the main principle I would say is that uh, it is governed by the uh, specific law and you cannot ex escape from uh, this interaction. You should really consider its um, impact on the contract, on, the PD, on any PD contract. This was just uh, a brief uh, introduction to this um, topic. Uh, there are a lot of different principles uh, dealing with uh, how to deal with the risk events, uh, and it is different uh, in different uh, publications. I will not talk about it because it will take us very, very. <laughs> we have we have some more particular questions, more specific questions, and uh, we will answer them later yes. on. And I believe uh, one more issue I will add uh, to you uh, yes. is that one of the main principles and the um, I, I would say the, the things that is different Fidik, from other contracts is the uh, avoidance of any disputes. Uh, yes. All the way construction mm -hmm. is uh, is planned the way that it won't go to to the court or arbitration. It will stay inside. Uh, any any argues any issues will stay inside, and parties will resolve them using the specific mechanism of the dispute adjudication uh, board uh, or dispute yes. avoidance and the adjudication board as from 2017. And this is one very great principle which is, uh, makes these contracts are very interesting. Okay, uh, no more details, we are going, we are going on. Uh, the next question, fourth one, uh, could you please share your experience in implementation of FIDIC yellow books contracts? Uh, I, will, I will add to this question that this question is asked by uh, our permanent participant, uh, Maxim from uh, Ukraine. And I believe this is reference to the Georgia, uh, specifically in Georgia means, thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Maxim. Thank you, Andre. Um, uh, recently, uh, in Georgia, uh, we see that the PDQ Yellow Book contracts are being used on the public project as well. So for some years, uh, the PDQ Yellow Books were mainly used on the private projects, such as uh, hotels, residentials, and so on. Mm, from now uh, days, we see that there were several tenders announced by the government authorities uh, announced under the yellow book contracts. Um, the differ just to give you introduction of uh, wo wo how it differs, like the red book or pink book or yellow book. It means that the red book and the pink book. Pink book uh, is being used for the projects that are financed by the MTPs, the multilateral development banks. Uh, it means that the design is made by the uh, employer. And so then it gives uh, the design, the red design to the contractor and the, the contractor has the main obligation of construction. The yellow book uh, contract means that the contractor deals with both the um, design and uh, the uh, construction. 
this is one of the applications of these yellow books. And that's why that uh, um, uh, public authorities now in Georgia uh, says, you know, think that uh, it may be useful and interesting uh, and beneficial for them to have uh, the single point of responsibility um, towards design and construction. And that's why we see that uh, more and more yellow book, the more and more tenders are announced uh, under the yellow book contracts. This is our experience and for so for some time we dealt with the yellow book contracts for only the private projects and very successfully I would say because uh, for the hotels uh, and for the residential buildings it works very well. And uh, from the global perspective, uh, speaking about the global practice and experience, uh, yellow books are working very well for the infrastructure projects as well. Uh, probably Rockley will also add something on this point. Yeah, uh, recently, uh, Georgian governmental entities, uh, the big infrastructure projects has been commenced or started with a yellow book using uh, mainly on the water sector, also some projects on the road sector and mainly on big infrastructure projects. So there are right now ongoing several yellow book contracts where the um, where the procedures are followed according to that to that uh, to that this this is a new introduction for georgia as well that the contractor will be uh, will provide the detailed design based on the basic design that the tender has been proceeded so uh, it's coming it's becoming more popular uh, in georgia on on uh, using the yellow book so uh, mainly we use the 99 so we haven't got any new uh, uh, new contracts yet on that matter so um, as Nina told and explained the design has been provided by the contractor and uh, approved by the uh, engineer so the projects are at this stage ongoing and let's see how the future will be okay thank you very much and I will add uh, our experience in Kazakhstan uh, state-owned projects are mainly goes to silver book budget monies are goes to silver book uh, not yellow it is usually it is usually red or silver <laughs> okay uh, moving on uh, fifth question is from colleague from uh, Tbilisi Anna she's asking what are the main and major challenges facing the implementation of the ferry contracts in Georgia please um, Iraqli please you can deal with this <laughs> uh, uh, Basically, we do not have so big experience in FIDIC like other countries, uh, but uh, our experience using FIDIC forms of contract are starting uh, quite early than some our neighbor countries, so to say. Yes. So uh, at the beginning, we, uh, which all, all the countries where the FIDIC contract forms of contract has been introduced, every uh, it's bringing a lot of uh, confusion. So. At the beginning, uh, we was also not really much understanding what's the what's the uh, benefit of a FIDIC contract, and the employer, me as an ex-employer, so to say, uh, we was using the uh, Georgian contracts for construction, where basically the construction company or in the second part, the contractor, basically doesn't have so much rights than uh, what you have. Uh, according to the in the FIDIC book but nobody was really understanding the principle as we was discussing before on the, for for implementing that project in recent years we have made lot of lot of trainings also in Georgia and at this stage I can say that the employers mainly using the FIDIC forms they are very very well aware of the procedures and uh, the the managing the FIDIC contracts. In recent years, it, it's becoming really much popular and the employer is fully understanding uh, the FIDIC contracts uh, and the procedures that they have to follow. Uh, we have also experience in other countries and with some of the employers that they do not really understand what the FIDIC means and what's the variation order or what's the claim or so on and so on. That At the beginning, it was really difficult to give them understand what what mainly the subclasses in a FIDIC form means and how they have to work with it. 
so at this stage, I see that uh, there is more understanding from the employer side uh, regarding the use of FIDIC and the procedural procedures are more or less followed well. Nina, do you want to add something? Just to summarize that the major challenge was the awareness of the FIDIC contracts and it still is, as Irakli mentioned, it is getting much better now, but still the awareness of the FIDIC contracts is probably one of the most challenges uh, that we meet in Georgia, not speaking about other countries in the region because uh, Georgia started it quite, um, it has been using the FIDIC contracts for some time, uh, Iraqli, you were the deputy when in 2000? But Georgia was using these forms, FIDIC forms from... For, yeah, for like for 10 2005, years. 2005, something yeah. like that. Yeah, so there is a, quite a lot of experience in using FIDIC contracts, but still, uh, especially uh, among the local contractors, uh, there is some misunderstanding, a lot of misunderstanding about the FIDIC contract. So this is the major challenges because just to, considering the... Uh, nature of the FIDIC contracts. They are not uh, easy contracts to administer and to, to deal with because they are, you need to understand the structure of the contract. And then uh, with some projects, it becomes easier and easier. But uh, for the first time, it's very, when you open the contract, it uh, seems to be very complex and uh, the awareness uh, is very important problem. Mainly, mainly the the problem by uh, using the FIDIC contract is based mainly on the contractor side here in Georgia. If we are at the stage that the contractor uh, is less aware than the employer. So employers are going through the trainings and they are getting understanding. I have even seen a case that the contractor was entitled for a lot of lot of claims, but he missed that opportunity because he doesn't follow up the procedures that he had in the contract. So. Um, yeah. we, we can see that kind of cases a lot. So, colleagues, mainly, uh, uh, colleagues yeah. I will add a couple more questions to questions to this one because it's very interesting for me and for my colleagues from another countries who are listening to you right now. Uh, who is the main driver for the FIDIC application in Georgia? Are there state bodies, state companies, uh, or the, it is multilateral banks only, or it's a private sector? Who is the main driver? I would say that uh, all of your mentioned uh, parties, because uh, all the projects that are funded by the multilateral development banks are mainly implemented under the FIDIC standard um, forms of contract. The private sector also very actively uses uh, these forms, uh, especially for the hotel um, construction, for the um residential projects uh, and so on so i would say that uh, both private and the public sector sector uh, are the active users of the fitting forms of contracts and mainly 99 percent of the investment projects that's uh, happening let's say hydropower plants and mm -hmm. so on all of them are fitting forms of contracts yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. I will ask more questions later on. We need to we need to move. Uh, the following question is number six: How to interpret sustainable development person to FIDIC? It is the question from from Burduan. Uh, the name of the person is not stated here. Oh, okay. Can you comment, please? Sure. I will address this question. Uh, it's a broad question and uh, difficult to answer shortly. I will just uh, remind you of the three main uh, principles and values that the FIDIC has. It's quality, integrity and sustainability. Uh, and FIDIC uh, has its uh, committees uh, for each of these direction and is actively working on each of these direction. Um, regarding the sustainability, it's one of the core um, um, 
direction that the PIDIC works on. There's a sustainable development committee uh, uh, within the PIDIC, which works, um, which is tasked with building a knowledge base uh, of project accomplishments and technology advances relative to sustainable development, uh, from which uh, to share the best uh, practices and the lessons that are learned. And I would encourage you to refer to the PIDIC website uh, for the PIDIC publication on sustainability and for the uh, sustainable approach, uh, how to deal with the project in a sustainable manner. Mm, there is a huge uh, database and knowledge base uh, in this regard for PIDIC that you can use uh, on your project if you're interested in it. I will post the, the relevant link in the um, uh, comment session and you can uh, address it wherever you're interested in. Great, thank you very much. And one more question for me. Uh, maybe it's a near one, but I think it will be very interesting about BAM modeling, uh, building information modeling. Is there any projects in Georgia which are uh, implementing using the FIDIC and BAM uh, approach? Do you have any experience or do you know any, any projects in Georgia? Iraqli, I may start uh, and then you can proceed. Uh, in my practice, I've seen around three projects, all of them were private, uh, when the uh, building technology was used. I won't say it was used um, successfully because uh, there is no much awareness of this technology so far in between the uh, parties. But I hope that uh, it will, the situation will change and uh, more progress we will, will see in this regard. Iraqli, you will add uh, the engineer, maybe something. Basically, uh, I agree fully with you, Nina, that uh, the projects, uh, it, there was a try uh, to implement the project, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, it was unsuccessful. Because okay. of the lack okay. of the awareness, I would say, so far. I see, I see. Okay. In Kazakhstan, it is as well, from time to time, let's say. Uh, okay, uh, moving on. Next question, number seven. Uh, it is, since the governing law is Georgian law, how similar are the FIDIC conditions and Georgian law? Are there any big differences and conflicts between FIDIC general conditions and Georgian law? I believe it's a pure legal question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, talking about, just to address the first part of this question, talking about similarity, I think it's not very relevant to talk about the similarity between the Georgian law and the FIDIC conditions because the FIDIC conditions are, are the standard form of the contract. So it means that they are not relevant. They are not direct. Uh, mm, um, how to say, uh, sections of uh, any kind of law uh, in the contract. But to talk about the difference and the conflict about uh, between the FIDIC general conditions and Georgian law, I would say that no, they are not uh, any major uh, conflicts uh, between Georgian law and FIDIC contracts. Uh, mainly probably because uh, when the PIDIC general conditions were drafted, the, one of the main purposes uh, of the drafting uh, committee and drafting persons was the, to make it um, more or less universal, uh, meaning that uh, any legislation could be applied to it. But of course, um, it does not mean that um, if no apparent conflicts are now uh, during uh, uh, the, my, my experience, it means that there could not be any conflicts. Uh, there may be uh, the conflict and uh, the principle is uh, considering the FIDIC uh, um, contract is that if uh, there are any mandatory provisions uh, in law, it means that the mandatory provisions of law will apply. At least it works like this in Georgian law. So there are two types of provisions, mandatory 
and uh, not mandatory, meaning that uh, if parties agree on something that does not contradict with the Georgian law, it's okay. So the parties can proceed with such kind of provisions. But if there is um, provisions regarding the um, uh, the mandatory principles, so for example, just to give you uh, an example, state reliability period, which is a uh, mandatory provision under Georgian law, uh, it means that uh, this provision shall apply. So this is just the main uh, approach towards the difference and conflicts, how to deal with the difference and conflicts between the Fidic and Georgian law. But uh, mm, there are no apparent uh, conflicts uh, to my experience in this contract. I would add, uh, if you don't mind, uh, yes. the, the, the major issue, I believe, is um, we need to address in this question is that the jo Georgia is the civil law country. Yes. Yes, uh, the the FIDIC is based on common law. This is two general uh, different approaches, but in some details they are quite uh, quite similar in some issues. Of course, well, it, it is it is it is impossible to implement a lot of different English law, common law issues for sure. But there may be some. I would say that may the in FIDI contracts there may be some unusual uh, concepts. So, for like liquidated example, damages. Liquidated yes. damages is a penalty. Uh, it, it, for it's example, a penalty. In Turkey, I, I, it works I'm, well. It works well. Okay, go, go, great, yeah. great. Because in, uh, in Kazakhstan, it's it it not yeah. works at all. In Russia, it oh, not okay. works at, at yeah, all. In, in Ukraine. I believe no. Uh, it, it almost not working anywhere. I mean, in post-Soviet yeah. countries, like uh, liquidated damages, then uh, about the liability, the освобождение uh, ответственности. I well, forgot this word. Indemnity. So, indemnity is 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 not working yeah. in Kazakhstan. I, I'm very yes. curious about the Georgian approach. If it's no, worked, we 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 tested these uh, clauses and uh, it was okay with the Georgian law. Okay, so great, there are no great, conflicts in this great, regard. Great. I would say uh, this was question from the colleague from Turkey, from Mr. Burak. Uh, maybe he's not aware about specific, or maybe he wants to be aware. Um, I want to get back to the first question because there is. One comment we need to we need to name it uh, about the COVID nineteen uh, regarding uh, first question one comment from the chat uh, COVID nineteen and three D contracts as I observe unfortunately the name of the person who wrote it is uh, not shown here. Uh, in all over the world, FIDIC avoided about their responsibility about force majeure. In Georgia, employer could help. Uh, to the contractors about only some limited EOT without payment of cost and expenses of contra contractors related to, to the time delay regarding COVID-19 restrictions. Yeah. <laughs> Totally agree. Oh, okay, great. Okay. I, I will uh, briefly comment in this regard. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it would be difficult to classify the COVID-19 as a force majeure under the FIDIC uh, forms of contract uh, because of the text uh, part uh, of the uh, subclause uh, 90.1. Epidemic is, is there, yes, epidemic. Yes, uh, in Georgia, what we've seen uh, is that um, the employers generally grant uh, the uh, extension of time uh, because of the COVID and me and Ratli dealt with several cases when we successfully argued for the uh, extension of time due to the COVID uh, situation here in Georgia. Mm, the other approach and what FIDI guidance on COVID-19 uh, says about is that uh, despite what uh, now not looking at what is written in the contract, considering the impact of the situation and considering the best interests uh, of the project, it may be um, advisable for both parties to reach uh, the amicable solution regarding the cost because uh, it, it, it really, the contractors really experienced and incurred quite considerable cost because of these restrictions and uh, other matters uh, in relation to COVID. So 
um, notwithstanding what is written in the contract, it may be a good idea to um, to negotiate with the con with the employer uh, uh, the situation and. I uh, mean, Iraqli have seen uh, such situations where um, not only the extension of time was um, uh, granted, but also some portion of the costs. So it is possible, and I totally agree that uh, the major practice in Georgia is to grant the extension of time rather than cost, but it's not impossible to argue the cost as well. Okay. Not go into the details regarding these claims and the processes actually uh, is ongoing still all the projects mainly which has been started before COVID so there is no big major project completed uh, at this stage yet so you cannot say that uh, the companies uh, at this stage the companies received only the extension of time uh for sure because there there is there is the every project is an individual so it depends on uh, how you draft the claim uh for the covid-19 the yes, yes. Uh, and even though we had uh, i will just give we had an official uh governmental uh, so to say order degree, yes? uh, degree regarding the covid-19 uh issues and the construction procedures uh, in Georgia. So based on that, uh, it depends. Every project is, is, is an individual uh, case. So um, it depends always. There are some contractors that they are able and possible. it's possible that they will get paid for this COVID-19 impact. But there are also some of the contracts that they, they can just uh, be granted by, uh, by extension of time without cost. So we have both cases. Okay. okay, good colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. It was, uh, uh, it was comment from Mr. Yin Gin. Uh, he wrote in the, in the chat his name. Great, uh, the next question, number eight. Uh, Green Book, does the formula work? This question comes from London, from our colleague, uh, you know him, Mr. Sean, um, who can comment about this formula? I, I believe we are speaking about uh, uh, experience Georgia. Uh, in Georgia, yes. Please. <laughs> Thank you, Sean, for this comment. I'm sure you attended also the FIDIC webinar for the new edition of the Green Book. And I will also post the link for the other participants uh, so they, that they can um, educate themselves about the new edition of the Green Book that is uh, to be published uh, in December during the FIDIC London uh, Users Conference. Well, speaking about Georgia, about the Green Book, I would say yes, it works because uh, um, as other participants uh, may know, the Green Book is the short form of the contract. Uh, compared to the red book or yellow book, it's very short. It's the general conditions is uh, around 10 pages um, in total. So it's, uh, it is written in a very, very simple uh, language and uh, it is recommended for, for um, works of simple nature or for repetitive uh, nature. And uh, in Georgia, I would say that uh, there are some projects that use this green book uh, and very successfully, I would say. Um, and um, the success uh, of the Green Book is uh, that uh, now um, there is a demand uh, for it to have it in Georgian languages because so that the local contractors uh, can use it uh, without any difficult difficulties uh, because of the uh, English version. So now the association. Uh, have has the license from FIDIC for translation of the, the green book and uh, we are now almost ready to start the works uh, on the translation so when there is a demand for a publication to be translated in the uh, in the language of a particular country i would say that it, it more or less mean that the formula work i would say and uh, in my experience, uh, I've seen uh, successful projects here in Georgia based on the Green Book. 
um, despite its uh, simplicity. And I would say that its main benefit is its simplicity because it's very, very uh, easy to understand what it's talking about uh, compared to other editions, which are quite complex. Directly, maybe you can add something uh, on this matter. Yes, I fully agree that the Green Book works really successfully in Georgia. Uh, there are a lot of lot of projects, basically, mainly financed by the governmental entities, uh, and has been implemented by the Green Book. Yeah, there are also some private contracts as well on the Green Book, and it's uh, it works really good. Uh, I was even surprised at the first days that I I saw uh, contracts in the private sector uh, on a, based on a Green Book. And uh, the, the contracts under 10 million, uh, mainly all of them has been or is, uh, has been implemented by the Green Book form, form of contract. So, and of course, Nina has told that we are so happy to receive the license for the Green Book. And soon enough, we will have a Georgian translation of that book. Great. Uh, very good uh, feedback about Green Book. Uh, we should go to the next question, number nine. In determining new rates for variation of an item cost and the base date or time or executing the works will be considered. Whether two rates may be applicable in this case, one for the original BOQ quantity and another rate for access quantity. Who can comment? This, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> uh, in general, we need to... Uh, look into the contract on 12.3 the evaluation uh, so there are uh, several criteria uh, how to evaluate and how to get the new unit rate uh, prices in practice uh, i have experienced that here as well in georgia so mainly that we was representing the employer that time uh, so mainly the boq original quantity has been paid by the original UQ uh, prices and the exceeded uh, exceeded budget, so to say, the exceeded quantities uh, was has been paid with a different rate. Now the question comes: Is that rate higher the original or is that low? Sorry, <laughs> I was just posting the link to for the YouTube. You yeah. can proceed. Sorry. Uh, is this is the question now is that quantity higher i mean the unit rate is higher or is lower so it depends on each case it's a separate issue so that that that's we need some kind of more specific examples that we can share our opinion on that so mainly there are there is, is, is a possibility there is that you can have two different rates on a variation order Okay, uh, Nina, you have something to add? No? No. Okay, no. good. Thank you very much, Rakli. Uh, the next question, 10th. What are the most common problems in Georgia according to contracts governed by FIDIC conditions? I think we, we almost answered something about it. Maybe you got something on, on your mind, new one to add, maybe. Uh, basically. Well. Yeah, we, we, we already talked about it. The most common problems regarding uh, the PD contract is that uh, the lack of awareness of these contracts mm -hmm. and all the associated problems uh, that coming from that, like uh, uh, not knowing how to deal with the claim procedures and therefore losing the right to claim uh, extension of time or additional what about policies. engineers uh, do you have uh, enough engineers who can manage such contracts local engineers or you most have. of engineers are foreign no uh, there is there is you know uh, it's a long time that georgia we can say that's a long time that georgia is using uh FIDIC forms of contract so i can remember my first FIDIC contract was on 2005 uh, and I was, I was pretty young that time. So uh, there are local engineers, there are quite a lot of uh, engineers, they mainly understand the basis, uh, the basic uh, procedures in FIDIC uh, contracts. So we cannot say that we, we do not have uh, FIDIC contract engineers. I mean, there, there is, there are a lot of uh, nice persons that they're dealing with the 
uh, FIDIC contracts and they are managing the FIDIC contracts uh, as well as in public sector as well as in in, uh, in a private sector. Uh, are they, are they uh, those engineers are locals, uh, local companies or it's uh, foreign companies? It's uh, uh, for I, I was telling about the individuals. Uh, so oh, okay. basically, okay. Uh, as a companies, there are yes, several. Companies. Yes, as a company, there are there are two or two or three companies basically, or four companies that they are dealing as a consulting uh, as a consulting and oriented only by FIDIC. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the representatives says Nina, and of course the and of course. Uh, international companies like ours Toho engineering and there are a lot of international companies here in georgia who are mainly dealing with the fitted contracts as well okay thank you uh move on uh the next question 11 11th uh, which chapters from the FIDIC red book are appropriate for the supervision supervisors consultants quality assurance plan you know well, if I understand uh, this question correctly, and if the person who posted it is currently here, do you know Andre? Give me a second. Mm -hmm. Mariam, maybe she's here, Mariam. Uh, I believe no. 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 No, she's here. She's here, Mariam. If you can uh, add something in the in, uh, yes, she's here. Uh, if you can add uh, something more uh, in the, in the chat, uh, we will answer your question uh, next one after twelve, if you don't mind, because yes, it's... because I understand that it comes from the practice, right, Mariam? And just to answer it correctly, because I I'll just generally speaking about the quality assurance, there is a separate subclause uh, in the contract. It's uh, 4.9, uh, which talks about the quality assurance that the contractor has the obligation to institute a quality assurance system to demonstrate the compliance with the requirements of the contract. And mainly the specific requirements to what is needed for the quality assurance are given in the uh, technical documents of the contract, not in the general conditions itself. It can be in the general conditions or it may be in the specifications of the contract and the employer's requirements. So this is just the general um, approach uh, to the quality assurance and where to find uh, the relevant uh, parts uh, of the contract uh, uh, in the text itself. So in the contract itself, it's the subclause uh, 4.9, which deals with the quality assurance. I'm talking about the old versions, 99 editions. But the mainly specific requirements can be found uh, in the attachments to the contracts, in the employer's requirements, specifications, uh, and particular conditions. Okay, I hope we answered your question. Yes, uh, thank you, Shirod. Okay, uh, next question, 12. Uh, time delays and solutions on feeding contracts and proposals of experts. Uh, quite broad question. Um, <laughs> uh, let's try to address something, uh, Nina. Well, first of all, there are two parts of this in one question. First one is time delay uh, and solutions on FIDI contracts, and the other one, proposals of expert. Um, okay, I will try to do it, but if the person is here, maybe he, he can talk more what he wanted to or she wanted to hear about it. Um, just to talk generally, uh, time uh, how FIDIC deals with the delays, um, there is uh, like uh, several sub clauses on how to deal with the delays and uh, the general approach is uh, to determine whose uh, risk event is this, the contractor's risk event, then what happens in this case, is the contractor entitled to the uh, time extension, uh, the uh, employer's risk event or a concurrent list shared risk event, and also how FIDIC deals with uh, time, uh, it gives the um, authority to the engineer to monitor uh, the uh, time progress uh, based on the program that is submitted to the contract. 
uh, and also uh, to penalize the contractor, it also has um, the contract uh, also deals with the delay damages so that the contractor is penalized uh, in case of the time delays. So these are the general uh, concepts uh, of how FIDIC deals with the um, time uh, in its standard forms of contracts. Uh, and these are the solutions that you can find in the text of the contract. Regarding the experts, I'm not sure about uh, what uh, experts uh, the uh, person means, because uh, a lot of experts can be involved in the implementation of the contract of any construction project, uh, and so of course, uh, which is implemented under the FIDIC contract. So I'm not sure how to answer on this part of the question. So if the person is here, I will be happy to hear yes. more. About oh, he's, uh, he's here, uh, Yingin. Uh, if if I not mistaken, have it? yes, he's here. And please write down in the chat uh, to, to some clarification for us to uh, to answer because we have still some time. And we are going on to the questions from the Q and A, uh, which are uh, happened during the webinar. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry, uh, and uh, there are five four three four questions we have okay uh, the first one from this list can you please give any information if you have uh, what's the success percentage of the implementation of the free contracts such as in contract close out process the claims of contractors about hangover process the extension of time delay damages not approvals views or not currently paid amount of over budgets and also, most important one, dispute and arbitration process. Means, mm, do you have any statistic uh, about the success on different parts of the FIDIC, uh, different instruments, let's say? Okay, I think I can start and then you roughly can uh, add on. Um, generally speaking, I would say that FIDIC contracts are successfully implemented in Georgia because uh, there are a lot of projects that are already uh, finished uh, based on the FIDIC contracts and so uh, they are already operating uh, in practice. I think I will address, uh, um, as uh, Engin uh, says, the most important part of his question regarding the dispute and the arbitration processes. Um, as I told you in the beginning, I am the DRBF representative of the, in Georgia, and I've done a small uh, research of um, how the dispute boards are implemented in Georgia. Um, so I've asked uh, five different state bodies about uh, their experience in this regard, and uh, I received the information that over 25 disputes were boards. So, I mean, uh, formal dispute board process were in place uh, since the beginning when the PD contracts were firstly used in Georgia. And uh, currently only uh, two uh, disputes are in the ICC arbitration. Uh, that's uh, about the major disputes that uh, have arisen uh, in Georgia for regard between the contractor and the employer. Very optimistic um, statistic, let's say. Yes, uh, because like uh, it means that the dispute board works well, I would say, because if there are no formal disputes, then it means that the dispute boards and the engineer works quite well. Uh, for the arbitration, this is the statistic that currently uh, one for definitely, and I think the other one is also in the process uh, in one of the sectors uh, in Georgia. Mm, that's the statistic for the uh, dispute and the arbitration. And uh, Iraqli can talk more about the uh, handle, like the claim and the extension of time and uh, variations, how they are implemented and uh, under pretty contracts in Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, as I have told as well before, uh, that uh, at the early couple of years, I mean, uh, at the early stages when the FIDIC was introduced uh, in Georgia, 
there was always a big misunderstanding, a big chaos, how to manage it, what to do, how to do, and etc. Because the governmental entities, was they do not have any idea what the FIDIC form means, basically. So it took uh, it took uh, several years uh, for for uh, for us to understand mainly what what the FIDIC is. Uh, after that, in that period, there was a lot of disputes. Uh, there was a lot of uh, disputes and arbitrations uh, through the uh, mainly the international companies was uh, getting the projects here and they was claiming without the employer was really understanding what they really wanted uh, so then these cases ended up in a arbitration or in a uh, in a dispute as well so uh, recently recent years um, the institute of dispute board works really good in georgia mainly in all projects mainly in major projects and most of them projects the dispute board uh, is has been appointed at the early stage at the beginning of the contract and this is the result that uh, the statistic that nina shared uh, this is because of that so the dispute board is every three months visiting the site checking the um, uh, process, uh, giving advices to avoid the dispute board, which is the new, mainly the main role that the dispute board has to do during, uh, as a standing dispute board has to do during his, uh, during his, so to say, work. With regards to the variation orders and uh, the uh, not approving the variation orders, I mean, I do not have such kind of experience not approving the variation orders, uh, basically, in there are some projects that the variation order are not approved because it was done wrongly or it's not according to the instruction and this, there are a lot of technical details but mainly um, takeover certificates extension of time uh, uh, and variation orders uh, the experience uh, the, empl the employers has a lot of experience managing this uh, these issues on the construction on the construction project uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm answering correctly. Is that the question? I think yes. I think uh, this was the intention of the uh, person who asked. Uh, I, I believe we can speak a lot and many, many more about this. I, I, can, I can speak the whole day mainly on yeah. the variation of claim extension of time. So I'm trying to make it a little bit short. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Because uh, they all just, I can uh, say even by not paid amounts, we had the case that the employer did not pay uh, the IPC or something, and the dispute board has decided to give. Um, I can say that case as an example that the employer did not pay the IPC. It passed the time limit that the contractor had to get their payment, and of course, uh, based on the dispute board's decision, which has been implemented by the employer, this is also very important. Not all of the employers are uh, taking the, uh, so to say, the decision to follow up the dispute board's decision. Uh, I see that around our country, in many countries, that they are not doing. Mainly in Georgia, they are uh, following up the dispute board's instruction or the decisions. So, and I can give you an example that uh, the contractor hasn't been paid by the employer uh, several IPCs, and based on the decision of the dispute board, the IPC has been paid with the interest rate on it uh, due to the payment, so with the penalties. So, if do you need any specific uh, uh, cases or any specific uh, questions regarding these issues, so please comment it, and we will try to answer it. Uh, means that there is no uh, enforcement procedure in Georgia for DB decisions. That's right, and they are uh, executing it by themselves. Uh, yes. yes, as in many Great. more countries, like Georgia Great. is not exception for it, and uh, there is no formal. Um, enforcement procedure in place in Georgia and legislation for the DAB decisions for the uh, um, enforcement of the DAB decisions. And moving to this topic, uh, there is a question from Karen. What about the government entities to accept the DAB decision? Do they mm -hmm. go to arbitration after DAB to? Because this question is interlinked, I would uh, answer it now if you permit. Um, sure. Generally, yes, uh, the government entities accept the DAB decision. 
So just to give you a comparison, when uh, there is a contract uh, between a, a private company and uh, government regarding any other case, and there is uh, the uh, dispute resolution mechanism is court, generally the position uh, and the tendency of the uh, state bodies is not to stop in the first instance, notwithstanding the success of the case, but to proceed it to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. just to uh, avoid any kind of questions from the uh, interrogatory bodies uh, mm -hmm. of why they did not proceed uh, the case. The situation is very different regarding the DAB decisions, I would say, because uh, the DAB uh, is the um, entity that is uh, that proved to be very successful throughout the world in the construction uh, and infrastructure projects. And that's why the main tendency is to accept the DAB decision and not to proceed to arbitration, because as you know, like for the major infrastructure projects that I financed by the IFI, so the costs of the arbitration platform is the ICC meaning uh, millions uh, of USDs for the cost of the arbitration, which is very uh, big amount for the government to pay. So if, uh, and just the statistics, the, my the statistic also evidence is it that uh, out of 25 uh, dispute boards, only uh, two were proceeded to the arbitration. That means that uh, DAB decisions are well accepted for, by the government. Uh, practice, very good practice in Georgia because in Kazakhstan it's different at all because uh, state, uh, state uh, entities uh, do not want to execute. And uh, moreover, we have uh, interesting practice in arbitration. There are, for the last three or four years, uh, several cases uh, in arbitration uh, institutions like ICC, uh, only in respect of the uh, cancelling the DAB decision because of the lack of the authority or uh, because of the breaching of some principles of the DAB. Uh, mm. It means confidentiality, impartial, impartiality, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this practice is go on in Kazakhstan. Uh, more and more decisions are canceled because of the procedural mistakes, because of the major principle principles mistakes. Let's say, mm. and it's uh, <laughs> that is why uh, they are afraid to execute any DEB decisions. This is uh, not very mm. good, uh, unfortunately. Unfortunately, one and a half months ago we had. A conference in uh, Uzbekistan when we discuss about the DB in Uzbekistan. There are some statistics about the five or seven dozens of the DB uh, acting DB on different projects uh, uh, right now, it means all, all mm -hmm. the time. But uh, from the, from the uh, let's say, construction, uh, from, from the site, right, from the site, information is that uh, DB are, are not working. They are, but they are exist, but they are not working at all. Nobody listen to them, and uh, there are a lot, a lot of problems with it. You can find uh, if somebody is interesting. Uh, there is a video on YouTube about it. It was Uzbek arbitration week, if I don't, uh, don't mistake. Uh, okay, uh, the next questions in the Q and A first. In the Q and A. Uh, how, how to interpret change in law in internationally irrespective of jurisdiction change? <laughs> it's a question okay. from Biblap Kantisom. Okay, thank you. I think it is addressed more to me because uh, interpretation is a more lawyerish thing. Yes. I will refer you directly to FIDIC uh, contract. Mm, I will share the screen. Here you go. It's subclause uh, 13.7, adjustment for changes in legislation. And it is direct, it gives some kind of guidance of how the change can be interpreted. It is uh, the introduction of new laws and the repeal or modification of the existing laws. 
this is how the change is interpreted uh, under fidic forms of contract. But of course, uh, it will depend on the specific uh, circumstances uh, of the case and of the laws that was changed, that was amended and was not the same as it was in the beginning. So it really depends on the circumstances of the case. But to give you a general interpretation and general guidance of how FIDIC uh, wants to do it, it's the first introduction of new laws. And second, the repeal or modification of the existing laws. Okay, thank you. Uh, of course, there are a lot of different kind of uh, issues uh, during any, any case. Uh, around not only not only one thing uh, change in law usually it's something more uh, because of something something happens and uh, additional money and so on so forth. Um, the last question in q a then we have one one question from chat uh, what's your opinion about steering and management of fitting contracts by engineers civil engineers or lawyers <laughs> okay, <laughs> Iraqli, I think we can deal it with both. So, because I am a lawyer and Iraqli is the engineer, but we work together so much and for so long time that we are mixing already. <laughs> so now I'm becoming. Who is the lawyer? Who is the engineer? Yeah, Iraqli will already learn the most important phrase for lawyers. It depends. <laughs> so, uh, just joking. Um, well, uh, the FIDIC approach is that, uh, firstly, uh, it is said that the FIDIC contracts were drafted by the engineers to be used by the engineers. So first of all, um, the main administration, in my opinion, should be done by the engineer. By the engineer who has uh, the skills, the legal skills, because uh, despite the fact that uh, mainly their engineering issues, there are so many procedures and so many concepts that are purely legal that you can't really manage the FIDIC contract without uh, the um, assistance from the lawyer. And the approach from the FIDIC, if you look at the introduction of each and every publication that FIDIC has, is that obtain the legal advice wherever appropriate. Just don't do anything important, especially termination uh, matters and things like this, which are of huge importance uh, to both parties without the involvement of the lawyer. So I would say the management of the FIDIC contract should be done mainly by the engineer, who is the project manager mainly, with the great assistant from the lawyer who is partly, who at least has this some kind of uh, engineering knowledge. So the approach of management of the contract should be mixed. Iraqli, correct me Thank if you. I'm wrong. Thank you that you gave the ground to the engineers first. <laughs> that's a long, that's the main, main question in FIDIC. There's the, uh, who has to, uh, who has to proceed with a co contract? I mean, it should be an engineer or a lawyer. Uh, definitely in a construction project, the engineer should be the project and <laughs> managing the FIDI contract, of course, with the assistant of uh, lawyers. Uh, definitely, there are a lot of procedural, uh, procedural processes that the engineer is not uh, capable to, to know about that. So mainly I agree that uh, I agree with Nina and this, this uh, argument or this question is a golden question in a um, FIDIC as well. Who, who is who? I mean, the engineers or the lawyers? So I believe both. Both, definitely both. I would agree with Nina uh, because on the practice we see it uh, every time uh, should be first engineers then lawyers, of course, but only engineers without lawyers, it will be very, very difficult. It will be a lot of mistakes, and uh, such of just such mistakes could happen only or, or become understandable only uh, on the court stage of litigation or arbitration. Unfortunately, that is why lawyers need to be uh, need to hold, uh, let's say, engineers in a lot of different issues. Um, okay, uh, the final question we have in the in the chat. Um, can you please give an information about payment of the arbitration cost? 
are the parties are sharing. Mostly parties avoid the cost of these processes and this mechanism does not work on contracts. Basically here, Nina, I can... Uh, oh, you can address it because you were on the employer side, so you yeah. know the mechanism, how it is financed. Yes, uh, mainly uh, it's 50-50. Uh, the employer and the contractor is sharing the costs. Uh, when we are talking about DB, when we are talking about dispute board, because arbitration is different. Yeah, the arbitration is totally different because the it depends of who advances the claim and who starts the arbitration proceedings, who pays for the claim costs, and then uh, how the costs for the experts and for other types are uh, shared. And in the end, it depends on the arbitrator how to share the cost. But in the DAB, Rockley can talk about how these costs okay. are managed. Mainly uh, the cost of maintaining the DAB uh, in the project uh, has been shared by 50-50 by the employer and the contractor. The contractor makes the transaction, puts the half of the pr uh, cost in the IPC, so and they are getting reimbursed by the interim payment certificate. So the cost of the DIB in Georgia mainly, in, I don't know for the other countries, but it works and um, the cost has been shared by both parties. Yes, and arbitration usually I will add, uh, because it's uh, not depending on the country, usually it's uh, each party bears its own costs on the arbitration or litigation as usual, uh, it happens. But in some cases, uh, uh, usual practice uh, in the judgment, uh, arbitration can uh, make the reimbursement that the lost party should reimburse uh, the other party all expenses or partly. There was a case, interesting case regarding the Kazakhstan, uh, which is ended this uh, summer. Uh, uh, the case took uh, five years from 2016. Uh, there was 11 issues in this case. Uh, and finally, uh, the arbitrators decided that 10 of the issues of 11 are not arbitrable. <laughs> uh, taking into account that the uh, period for going litigation is, is expired locally, three years. Uh, and the final, the, the main is interesting issue is that the, the claim was about several dozen of million USD, but the finally uh, arbitrators decided to pay seven or six million, I don't remember to whom it's not the matter, but the matter is that each party bears around uh, from seven to 10 million USD to, uh, to hold this arbitration process for the lawyers, for the witness expert, for the all expenses. And uh, arbitrators decided that each party bears its own costs. That's all. Nobody will get any reimbursement from anybody. This was <laughs> very strange, taking into account that the arbitrators are very, very well-known persons in the arbitration, construction, and FIDIC world. If you are interested, I can share the uh, GAR review. It was provided by our colleague from Uzbekistan. It's very interesting. That is why when we, are going, when we are going to arbitration, it is always costly. It is minimum 1 million in your mind should be to start the process. Uh, there are some cases you need, you, you, you can spend less for some urgent procedures, freezing orders, something else. Um, but it's again, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.4 uh, million USD. It's very costly. It's very long. Uh, and finally, uh, no, nobody knows what will be the decision, because even uh, the, the uh, very famous, known, very, very well-known professionals, it's impossible to prognose uh, what kind of uh, decision they will uh, they will make. That is why our recommendation arbitration is the last, is the very very last instance. Uh, we need to uh, we, we need to uh, have uh, at least. Um, very poor, uh, let's say, mediation, uh, very poor peace agreement, uh, not very good, maybe, it may, in means of, uh, in means of uh, to, uh, not win-win, not win-win at all, but to avoid any arbitration, because arbitration is very costly. Um, just to briefly add, who are the main beneficiaries of arbitration? Just there is a common state, thing. State-owned com company. 
No, lawyers. <laughs> ah, lawyers. Oh, you mean uh, yes, because because it's not cheap to pay lawyers. Even yeah. though I will say you, the arbitrators will get will got less than the lawyers. Indeed, I, it's it's. <laughs> It's, it's practice. If you don't mind, I will make uh, one short notice about our event in Kazakhstan, which are making We Are Tushenko and Partners. We're making the Russian language event, which which is uh, online course, one month's uh, online course regarding the uh, FIDI contracts in Kazakhstan, uh, the practice of uh, implementation and application of those contracts in Kazakhstan. Uh, the course duration is one month. It's like uh, 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 it's like uh, uh, Seventy percent of all materials are learned by distance, uh, by video. Then uh, a lot of discussions by webinars, uh, meetings with the speakers, uh, getting answers from the from the persons who are reading the uh, lectures, and then uh, making some homework, getting. Uh, getting the feedback and finally uh, going through some tests and getting the certificates from uh, our company with the uh, pointing the results of the tests inside. If uh, somebody will be interested in it, please uh, feel free. Uh, also, I'm, uh, I see a lot of uh, thanks from uh, participants uh, to you, Nino, to you, Rackley. Thank you very much. It, it was very interesting. Uh, and my camera is shut down. I'm very sorry, give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, Thank you very much, Andre, for organizing it. It was very good to share our experience and our practice uh, on the PD contracts in Georgia and maybe in other. We um, should do countries. it once, once in a quarter, uh, because uh, the, the the people are asking to make it the, uh, to make it often, more often, let's say. And uh, I believe you will uh, will support us, and we will make something in January. Uh, maybe not in December. Everybody is on the vacation. And... Uh, there is one question request. Sure. So maybe we can give a oh, chance. From our colleague from uh, Uzbekistan. <laughs> yes. uh, where is it? Chat. May so, I give a question? There is just a request for it. <laughs> yeah. There is no question. We are waiting for the question. <laughs> we okay. still have time. Okay, we still have time. If you have any questions, sure, feel free. Uh, we will be <clears throat> welcoming all your feedback, especially negative feedback. If anything was done wrong by us, please write down in the chat. We need to be better. We need to uh, do it more interesting, uh, more exciting. Please write down because every, everybody says, uh, ah, Firuza. Uh, Firuza, yes, Firuza, you can write down this question, please, please. We are here. Uh, yeah, uh, on the previous webinars on Russian language, there was around uh, around 20, 25 questions from uh, from participants in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and for Russia, there was around 50 questions. We was online around two two plus hours uh, answering those questions. Some of them was very very uh, simple one because people even uh, didn't understand uh, that uh, this the simple issues. That is why. We, we was trying to answer everybody. Uh, well, okay. Just comparing the size of Georgia, Russia, and Uzbekistan. Georgia is not that big country. That's why the questions were not so many. So, but still, very interesting questions. And so I would say I would say the questions are quite uh, qualified, uh, more specific. It's good. It's good. I think uh, we will need to have uh, more such uh, such sessions for Q and A. Uh, for a sure. period, uh, I worked in Uzbekistan. I wanted to attend your event, but unfortunately, could not hope to attend uh, another. It's, uh, uh, yeah. We can uh, say that we might have a, <clears throat> we might have an event in uh, jointly, like it was the previous time. Uh, we are working on it with the Uzbek Association, so it might be that we can repeat this training, what was happening in Tashkent, um, somewhere in next year. Uh, with the same trainers so uh, we will inform you we will inform your society as well and definitely we would be happy to it's great yeah. very good and uh, firuza uh, has sent the question uh do you consider the db members non-disclosure about the conduct of the 
training at the premises and by the invitation of one of the parties as a breach of the general conditions of the DAP agreement attached to the GCC, general conditions contract, which provides that the number, that the member shall not previously been employed as a consultant or otherwise. What if no payment has been received for this training? I would add to this comment, Firuza was on our, uh, on, was the participant of, of those training in Uzbekistan. And uh, that is why she's asking the question, I believe. Well, <laughs> difficult question to answer. I believe if she right. will uh, disclose it, uh, why not? And parties uh, won't, uh, dis uh, won't disagree. I mean, the parties will agree with it, why not? Well, um, um... I would refer to the IBA rules uh, on the conflict of interests. Um, the International Bar Association uh, has a very useful uh, publication on the conflict of interest and what to disclose and what to know not during the arbitration procedures. And it can be directly applied to the dispute board uh, um, proceedings. In my opinion, um, I would say that non-disclosure of the uh, situation that uh, Firuza explained um, does not mean that it is uh, a breach of uh, the, of the, uh, the DAB agreement. Uh, because uh, the educational activities cannot be limited uh, to uh, cannot be limited and it's so wide that uh, it's very difficult to limit such kind of things and uh, speaking about the disclosure the main thing is the uh, how Mm, the arbitrator or the dispute board member feels about it, uh, like uh, if it uh, feels conflicted with any party, uh, then it should disclose, of course. Mm, I think if I was the, uh, the uh, trainer and one of the participants were attending my trainer training, if I know the list of the training participants, I would disclose it because my approach is to disclose uh, wherever circumstance uh, could be. Um, I don't think that it could be the reason for rejection of the DB member, but uh, I would disclose. But there may be a situation when the uh, trainer does not have the list of participants and he simply does or she does not know who attended uh, the training by uh, names and positions and like this webinar, like this webinar, yeah. for example, because yeah. in, so in, it would be see, very yeah. difficult to administer it. So I don't think that it should be treated like a breach uh, of the uh, DAB agreement. And also so I think uh, intention should be taken into, into account. If there so, was yeah. some intention. Sorry, Sorry. interrupting. Yeah, yeah. Right now is a, a certified dispute board, uh, dispute adjudication board. Yes, in the list soon enough. So uh, there are also some employers participating. So is that a conflict of interest? Uh, we can say that. So, That's you, what you know. I said, that potentially speaking, that uh, some of you may appoint me in your future dispute board, uh, um, and you are attending now this uh, webinar. It would be very difficult for me to obtain the list uh, and to check all the participants who attended it, especially the webinar, because there are some participants which are not uh, identified by their names yeah. directly. Yeah. And uh, I would disclose for definitely if I am sure that this person attended, but uh, I don't think that it should be the reason for rejection. In case of, in case of the dispute board has done a special, especially training for the employer, that might be a reason. Uh, and he, he has been hired, let's say the roads department, he's making it, they are making a training for their own staff and they are hiring a dispute board uh, member for them to conduct the training, 
that might be the conflict of interest. But in case of there is a association organized uh, event for a training and their employer comes or the contractor comes, uh, in such case I do not see a, a reason to be, so to say, conflicted. conflicted. Okay, then thank you very much. I believe we answered all questions we had. Uh, great. Uh, a lot of thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, support of the uh, by the Association of Consulting Engineers of Georgia uh, of this event. And uh, I think we will see you next time in a couple of months. Thank you very much. Be in touch. And this video will be available uh, uh, on YouTube in a couple of days. And I will send, uh, we will send the uh, link to everybody, to all participants and so on. So thank you very much, colleagues. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.